was um, when, uh, when, when Marie joined us, um, and we'd already got a full um, program for the previous seminar series, um, and Marie was kind of talking about her work to me, and I hadn't realised that what an interest I would have in her work, because we come from uh, different uh, fields, but as anyone here who's been taught by me, you know how much I appreciate the student's voice, um, um, to the point where you might think sometimes the students are doing the work in, in my sessions, which uh, I completely accept. Um, so when Marie talked to me about her work, this seemed like a great opportunity to um, um, start um, the theme for the new, the new seminar series, i.e. the one that we're in now. Um, so in many ways, um, uh, Marie's work has been influential to this whole series, which no doubt will end in a book or a special issue or something. So um, can I just um, say that it's great to have Marie as a relatively new colleague um, and somebody who's very popular with the students and staff alike. Um, I won't say she's the nicest member of the team because it, everyone else will get offended, but um, she probably is. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, the worst thing is when I've described her. Yes, yes, yes. Well spotted. Um, so, yes, I am being supportive to all of my colleagues, yes. Um, but the best thing is when I refer to her as, as the nice member of the team, which is the point I was getting to, because that's really bad for the rest of us, isn't it? Um, but it's only a joke, folks. Um, uh, but, um, you know, as I say, Marie's very popular with, with students um, and fre frequently um, having my you nose know, rubbed in that by, by the students who I'm trying to impress. Um, and I would say that, um, um, you, you know, to have, like, such a new project, because is it one year that you've had your PhD now, Marie? Yeah, it's a bit over. A bit over a year. So th this is it's really great to have, you know, brand new work, as it were, uh, and I know that I've, I've worked on this in, in, from a similar part of this project it, for the next book that we've got coming out in July, um, and that was interesting to work on that br brand new work that I know nothing about except for what you've taught me. Um, so um, can I just ask you then to, to um, you know, show your appreciation for Dr. Marie Castling. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to present my work in the CCCSDS seminar series. Um, I also want to start by taking the opportunity to thank my colleagues at Hope um, who have been really influential. <coughs> Obviously Alan, I don't know kind of who knows who doesn't, but he was my supervisor for my PhD. So he's been a really great influence on my work and was really supportive. Um, Claire and Jessica and Laura and Alan and David um, and Maria have all sort of helped to develop my understanding of disability studies and again sort of um, been another great influence on kind of my ideas and thoughts around the stuff that I kind of do. Um, so I'll just start by um, just talking a little bit kind of about my background. Um, <coughs> so the paper that I'm going to talk about today is based on the stuff that I did for my PhD. And I've always, always had a keen interest since undergraduate, really, um, in inequality, um, exclusion in education. And with my PhD, I was provided with the opportunity to um, explore the experiences of young people who have received the behavioural, emotional and social difficulties label. <coughs> and although there have kind of been lots of different studies that have been published around the BASD label, there's sort of relatively few that have really engaged with the young people themselves. There's a tendency to sort of prioritise adults' um, perspectives. So quite often you'll see papers that are published around parents and teachers and sort of their understanding and experiences of um, <coughs> this label. And an important focus for me with my PhD was always going to be um, sort of placing emphasis on the pupil voice. <coughs> so this is kind of just what I'm sort of talking about today. It's going to be a reflection of my experiences of sort of my journey into the realm of pupil voice research. Um, and there are a number of sort of key themes that I encountered sort of on my way. Um, I'm going to start by just providing a brief overview of sort of the history um, of the position of children and childhood. Um, then I'm going to just talk a little bit about my studies specifically and kind of what I did. Then I'm going to um, just explore briefly the notion of voice and what we mean by voice. Um, and then <coughs> what I think would be really important for this uh, presentation is that I actually let you hear the voices of young people. So I'm going to um, present um, some of their experiences um, in terms of their educational journeys 
<laughs> so then, from the earliest times, children were to be seen and not heard. Indeed, throughout the 19th century, they were considered to be passive, salient, compliant, submissive, and incompetent spectators in life events. Children in legal terms were at the time observed as property and were regarded by law alongside married women and lunatics as person on, persons on a disability according to the Supreme Court Act 1873. They had few rights and no voice. The positionality of children within society and indeed the law remained largely unchanged until a landmark declaration on the rights of the child in 1959. While this declaration and subsequent legislation began a process of safeguarding children and providing for their protection, it did not empower children. Therefore, successive generations of children, specifically within education and more generally within society itself, were effectively signed by legislation in the paternalistic hierarchical, hierarchical system that dominated 19th and early 20th century. Towards the latter half of the 20th century, <coughs> The literature based details the development and the right to the child, and both researchers and educationalists acknowledge the importance of listening to the voices of young people. So, for example, we had the United Nations Convention on the Right to the Child in 1989, which was seen as being a sort of a key turning point in terms of children's rights. <coughs> in terms of um, sort of more broadly thinking about disabled children, um, it's been suggested that they've been problematic to researchers and policy makers. They've been negatively stereotyped, highly intervened with, seen as having the lowest worth and subjected to abuse, oppression and segregation. They are categorised as a burden and drain of resources, passive, vulnerable and dependent. <coughs> Yet yeah, Connors and Stalker argue the problems of disabled childhood are a result of social relations, cultural representations and behaviour of adults. It's been suggested by Timmy by the end of the 20th century, our vision of childhood in the West is a polarised one. In one pole we have the victimised innocent children who need restroom, and in the other pole we have impulsive, aggressive sexual children who are a threat to society. So he sums this up as being children at risk. So the idea that there's been a loss of childhood, and then children as the risk. And it's clear that children who've been identified as having behavioural, emotional and social difficulties will come under the category as children who present a risk to society due to the behaviours that they display. <coughs> so in terms of um, what I actually did for my study, um, my study was <coughs> based in the northwest of England. Um, I, did, had three, I developed 13 case studies. Um, I wanted, as well as getting the pupil voice, so I spoke to 13 young people, but also spoke to the parents and the teachers in order to kind of get sort of a broad sort of idea of what was going on with the child. I felt it was important to include the adults that surround the child as well, but remaining focused on the people themselves. And um, the pupils that I spoke to were all aged between 13 and 16. Um, they were attending three different educational provisions. They'd all been excluded from mainstream education, so they were either placed in a special school, they were placed in an alternative um, educational environment, so that could be um, a college um, or <coughs> one of those settings. Um, and then there was a group of children who were sort of they were connected to a mainstream school, but they were being provided for in a support centre, which is kind of similar um, to what would used to have been referred to as people referral units. So they'd all been excluded from school. Um, there is a particular stigma that's attached to the uh, BESD label, in that children are seen to be manipulated and in control of their behaviours, and um, maintains of the sort of how it's perceived quite often by adults. <coughs> when I think when I think back to kind of when I first started on my PhD, I do think I was kind of rather naive in terms of what I could achieve, and I had sort of quite idealistic goals in terms of what I thought it would just be a really nice project, speaking to the pupils, getting their opinions. Didn't really take into account all the issues that I would encounter, sort of as I went through and spoke to the children, kind of all the obstacles that I faced and that's kind of what I want to discuss today.
is some of the issues that <coughs> came up um, when I chose to use pupil voices in my methodology. So pupils were, um, it was really important to me that I spent time sort of developing uh, methods with pupils so that the research, kind of trying to move away from um, this idea of researchers going into environments and doing on to young people. I wanted, research, I wanted the young people themselves to kind of feel part of the process of the research. Um, so I began, the first year was spent um, consulting young people on how they'd like to be heard. So I went into a range of different provisions and we discussed sort of different research methods and different ways that they could have their voices heard. And I am kind of a bit sort of cynical in terms of the inherent power, sort of power dynamics that you could sort of can't escape when you go in as an adult to a children's sort of environment, whether it be a school or any of the other sort of different provisions, and sort of how whether you'd actually be able to sort of break down those barriers so the young people did sort of feel like they could trust you and could say kind of what was on the mind rather than I think it's quite difficult to sort of change the dynamics between adults <coughs> and young people and that's kind of one of the challenges that I faced and I don't think maybe necessarily all young people are comfortable with taking on the role of sort of changing the dynamics and feeling like because quite often it's not well, it's not very often in school environments that you do get the opportunity to sort of really have your voice heard, potentially. So to go from, I think it's quite a sort of a difficult manoeuvre to go from sort of being constantly told what to do and the expectations to then sort of flip that around. <coughs> um, as well as um, sort of the issues around the methods. And it was really important that the methods that were developed were kind of really flexible and <coughs> not restrictive so that they could constantly evolve in terms of sort of what were the needs of the children in terms of how they wanted to be heard. Um, yeah, so I didn't want to just go in and sort of tell them what was going to be happening and I wanted to sort of, as best as I could, um, try and change that sort of dynamic. It's also really important for researchers to sort of reflect on their own positionality um, in terms of when they, they want to do sort of pupil voice research and that I don't think it's possible to be objective and I'd never suggest that the research was objective in any way. I clearly had an influence in terms of um, the research that was produced as part of this project. And for, the, for example, say, if, depending on my mood, would depend on kind of how the children would react to me. <coughs> I did kind of have some, even though I spent time consulting with the young people, there were obviously ideas that I had coming into the PhD that would have influenced kind of sort of the way the conversations went. And Barnes has um, also suggested that um, it's not possible for researchers to be independent. He goes on to suggest that you're either on the side of the oppressors or the oppressed. In terms of my research, potentially, although it might be seen as being sort of quite extreme, the pupils could be seen as the ones who are being oppressed by the adults who surrounded them. So the adults would be the possess um, oppressors. And in terms of which side I kind of fell on, although I obviously really wanted to be on the side of the children, there were possibly occasions maybe when I could have been sort of seen to be more on the side of the oppressors in terms of what happened during the course of the research. <coughs> Oliver also highlights that it's important for researchers to consider who benefits from the <coughs> research. Um, I obviously benefited from the piece of research because it enabled me to become a doctor. Um, I'm hoping to get publications from the research so there were clear benefits for me. In terms of the pupils, this is something that I kind of struggle with in terms of what actual difference did it make to their lives being part of this sort of research and PhD. Yeah, you could argue that <coughs> they benefited from having the opportunity to have the say and have their voices heard, but really what difference did it kind of make to their lives and their um, educational journeys? So these are just some of the things that I kind of, I still struggle with now to be honest in terms of thinking about my own research <coughs>
Um, so what do we mean by voice? And um, the term voice can mean different things to different people. <laughs> there are lots of issues around notions of voice and disability studies. But I want to focus specifically on the ideas around pupil voice. Um, due to the complicated nature of said, um, such terms, a number of concerns have been raised. For example, Rose has warned that language of children's participation can be cosy and has suggested that we need to be more critical of the circumstances in which children are asked to participate in decision making. The importance of participation has also been highlighted by Benefin, who states great harm can be done to children by well-meaning adults who fail to understand how the child interprets what is happening. When examining the literature, it appears to illustrate how it's adult agendas which tend to dominate the field of pupil voice. As research is guided by adult, adult decisions about what is relevant and important, so there's a clear need to kind of be cautious when you're applying this term to your work. <coughs> it's also been suggested that child's voice is a social construct and that cautions have been made against too simplistic a usage of the term voice. Clearly it is essential for researchers to reflect upon their own positionality within the context of their research and how they interpret and present the perspectives of young people. It's become increasingly fashionable to link the idea of voice with terms such as working from the bottom up and participation in order to describe different forms of collaboration between young people and professionals. I've as voice has been reinterpreted in these different collaborative relationships and applied <coughs> to an increasing range of issues, there is a danger of it becoming a buzzword that loses much of its original meaning. With the widespread use of the terms such as the voice of the pupil, there is a danger of creating a type of chicken soup effect where the voice is held out as an unquestionable good to be endorsed by all, a common if somewhat dangerous side effect of children's rights discourse. Um, Ashby explored the notion of voice in, <coughs> in disability studies research and is critical of the idea of researchers giving voice. He argues that the practice can actually reinforce the very systems of oppression that it seeks to redress. Regardless of the intentions of the researcher, hierarchies of power and privilege are reinforced when the researcher presumes to give voice to someone else. In order for disabled students to be heard and listened to, they become objects of the research of the research where their voices are mediated and interpreted. <coughs> so as part of the processes that I adopted, um, we did the data collection, and um, I'm sorry I didn't say what we actually did um, for data collection. Um, I decided to do a mixture of group work um, and individual interviews. <coughs> So we, in each setting, we'd meet as a group and develop activity sessions to explore a range of different issues around sort of their educational journeys. So we look at stuff around um, experiences of teachers, sort of where they've been placed. We also explored the notion of pupil voice um, and how they'd like to be heard in education. <coughs> Following on from them, we did one-to-one -one interviews where we tried to track their educational journey. So I had a grid that would fill in together, which would um, take account of every year in their education. Um, and they'd have a line at the bottom where they'd indicate sort of how happy they were in each of the different provisions. So all of them had experienced a number of different um, educational settings. So there'd be a range of um, mainstreams, potentially special schools, <coughs> alternative provisions. Um, so yeah, that was kind of, so they were the methods that were developed. Um, once I'd analysed the results, I then went back to the student and said, These, this is how I've interpreted what you had to say to me. Have I captured it right? Um, so I, it was important for me to give the opportunity to them to just check that what I was sort of interpreting was along the right lines in terms of what they wanted to say and the messages that they wanted to share. <coughs> so it was important that they kind of sort of part of all the processes throughout the research. Um, I'm just going to return now just to um, look at why sort of there's been this emphasis on pupil voice um, <coughs> and link back to um, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child um, and specifically Article 12 which states that parties shall assure to the child who is capable of forming his or her own opinion, 
their own views, the right to express those views freely. In all matters affecting the child, the views of the child being given due weight in accordance with the age and maturity of the child. <coughs> Although this is kind of seen as being sort of a significant turning point. Um, if you look more closely at Article 12, there's clearly sort of an influence in terms of the subjective judgments made, um, quite often by adults, in terms of who's seen as being sort of mature enough to have a, an opinion and to have the voice heard. And in some cases, um, it's been argued that <laughs> young people who have received the BESD label wouldn't be seen as sort of being capable and mature enough to have the voice heard because of the preconception, preconceptions that surround um, that group of children. Um, New Labour introduced a series of key initiatives which are aimed to provide young people with the opportunity to have their voices heard. An example of this is the Code of Practice from 2001, which promoted pupil participation and emphasised the right of the child with SEN to be involved in decision-making processes. Acknowledge that children should be encouraged to participate in all decision making processes that occur in education, including setting learning targets, developing individual education plans, selecting schools, <coughs> and contributing to assessments and reviews. So, although this kind of demonstrates the importance that's been placed on seeking the um, views of young people, um, it's, a lot of people have suggested it's kind of sort of been left mere rhetoric and sort of the reality of what happens for young people is very different. In terms of quite often the way that that's interpreted in schools, this idea of pupil voice is ideas around school councils. <coughs> now there are lots of issues of school councils in terms of um, who actually is part of the school council. In terms of there's quite often there's a specific type of pupil that will be asked to be part of the school council and there's arguments that a child who'd been labelled as having BESD is probably unlikely to be asked to be part um, of that event. <laughs> so there are kind of there are issues around it sort of see, being seen as kind of tokenistic, and again, sort of adult voices dominate even within um, school councils. In that the young people who I spoke to when we got into this sort of conversations around pupil voice. And they were talking about their experiences of school councils. Um, it quite the were the one in the special school. <coughs> um, interestingly, the majority of the pupils that I spoke to were part of the school council in the um, special school, and there were kind of issues there in terms of. Um, I'll go on to talk about this a little bit um, in a minute, but the guy, <coughs> the head teacher at this uh, special school really wanted to sort of remain in control over what was happening. Although he gave me access and allowed me to come into the school, um, it was sort of a constant battle with him in terms of sort of what he'd allow me to do. Whereas the other provisions were kind of a lot more open um, to the research. So he made sure that he kind of selected pupils who would come and talk to me. And sort of not surprisingly, yeah, the majority of them were part of the school council which kind of suggests linking to the idea of kind of whose voices are heard. Um, <coughs> but when they were talking about their experiences at the school council, um, they kind of just said that all they'd do is talk about so what trip they were going to go on, and it was the same trip every year, they go to the same place. So kind of what impact school councils really have um, is sort of questionable. Um, Due to kind of the nature of the study, ethical considerations are going to be sort of, of real importance. <coughs> and in the UK, ethics of engaging in sociological research directly involving children have primarily been shaped by definitions of competence. So there are issues there in terms of linking back to the UNCRC around ideas about competence and who is competent to participate in research. <coughs> So as part of the process it is, um, in order for the children to be able to, all the young people to be able to take part in the study, I had to get permission from the parents and their adults that surrounding them. So kind of, yeah, again, adults are sort of acting on their behalf in terms of deciding whether they're able to take part in the study. Um, so I've briefly touched on the inherent power and balance that occurs between adults and young people. 
and also the fact that all the data collection took place in the young person's school environment. So <coughs> that again reinforces the idea of adults being in a position of power. Um, so research is a long tradition of viewing young people as objects and not people in their own right. And that within the research world, young people are often controlled and bounded by adults who choose what and how children's world are to be investigated. And although I did spend time sort of consulting with young people as a prior to any sort of data collection taking place, um, it was important that we developed a relationship of trust. And I still need to kind of acknowledge my influence on the research. <coughs> so it's been suggested to adults control sort of the environments that young people occupy. And this is really reflected in kind of my experiences during the study. Um, <coughs> so I talked a little bit about the head teacher at the special school. So he yeah, wanted to be involved in terms of selecting who could actually participate in the study. Um, he also wanted me to be in a room that was next door to his office um, when I met with the children. The door had to be open, obviously, to the room that I was in. The door to his room was open at all times, so he could hear kind of what was going on. And the pupils were aware that their head teacher was listening to what they had to say to me. So that was going to greatly influence kind of the responses that I got from the young people. <coughs> For example, when I asked about kind of who was the favourite teacher and why did they like that teacher, one of them said the head teacher because he knew he was listening. I think the head teacher even commented and shouted back to the young person. So yeah, there was kind of real sort of issues there um, <coughs> in terms of yeah, sort of the adults still kind of controlling. Interestingly though, it did seem to depend on the setting and the support centre that I went into and the alternative provision sort of gave me a lot more freedom in terms of um, allowing me to go to a different room. He didn't really sort of have any control over what was happening. <coughs> and I remember in one, um, I didn't use this particular provision for the actual PhD re um, research, but one of the first sort of places that I went to um, just kind of said, yeah, just go, go and talk to young people, that's fine. And I had to actually remind them that there were sort of ethical issues that we need to be aware of in the fact that I can't just go and speak to the young people without getting permission from the parents. Without, I think they just wanted, they just saw like a chance to have a break from teaching and just thought I could take the whole class. And I was like, no, that's not going to, that's not happening. <coughs> So these, are the, I obviously kind of really struggled with sort of the issues, especially with the special school head teacher. In that, I was obviously really grateful that it gave me access to the young people um, and to sort of have the opportunity to sort of explore um, <coughs> their experiences. But it was kind of how do I? I never really felt like I could say anything, whereas maybe I should have said something about kind of his issues around control. I mean that might be more to do with kind of my personality and the way that I am. That yeah, I was just kind of and being a PhD student, I was just so grateful that I had the opportunity to just to kind of talk to people that I didn't really maybe question enough kind of his role in control and what happened. Um, <coughs> so what I'm gonna briefly do now is just explore some of the um, messages that young people had to offer in terms of their experiences um, of education. <coughs> so I split these into three main themes, um, and these are sort of the main themes that came out from my PhD. The first one being the actual BESD label itself. The young people that I spoke to <coughs> I'd never heard of the behavioural, emotional and social difficulties label. They had heard of things like ADHD, so we were able to associate with terms, um, those types of terms. But the BESD label itself was not something that they kind of, they had an awareness of. Um, there were sort of issues in terms of how they felt they were perceived by adults. So Tyree says, um, they would never believe me, they would always think that I must be a bad kid. <coughs> So after receiving this label, 
it was kind of a clear stigma that they felt was attached to them in terms of how they were to be perceived by adults. <coughs> um, BSD is not something that's kind of medically, it's not a medically recognised condition. It's quite often a label that will be attached to young people um, based kind of on subjective judgments um, of teachers. <coughs> And there's all, we had, <laughs> there was issues around kind of how do you distinguish between somebody who should receive a label of BSD compared to somebody who's just maybe naughty um, in class. So when the young people were talking about sort of their experiences of assessments, they were saying that they hadn't been assessed, it was just kind of something that had been said to them by teachers, that they had a problem with kind of the behaviour. They might not necessarily use the BSD label, but would say that they had a problem um, in terms of the way that they were behaving. There was also, which was, I found this quite interesting, um, Adam, one of the pupils, says, I think it is just made up, I think it is a joke. In some cases it's just you're hyperactive and you just give in instead of calming down. So this again kind of reinforces the stigma that's attached to the label, even given that even peers are kind of really critical <coughs> about whether the label actually exists. And this idea of young people being able to control the behaviour and making an active decision not to control the way that they behave. <coughs> um, but there were some young people who wanted um, a label attached to them. So kind of there's this idea that labels are somewhat of a sort of double-edged sword. You know, there's clearly a stigma that's attached to labels, yet some people still continue to pursue a label because it gives them some form of reassurance. So Louise says, I would just like to make sure, because if I have, then at least I can get it not fixed, but I can get diagnosed with it, and we'll be better off. I won't know what to do, I won't know where to go. <coughs> so she clearly has the desire to kind of get diagnosed, but doesn't know kind of what to do. Um, reinforcing again this idea of sort of perceptions around children who have had sort of labels around behaviour attached to them. Daniel states that I get an incident and the staff do nothing. When it's got something to do with me, when it's me saying something has happened, they do nothing. So clearly this idea that they feel like they're not being heard um, by staff. And this was linked kind of because they've been given um, the label of BESD. Um, about half of the young people that I spoke to have been put on medication. <coughs> now there are real issues with sort of the medication that's used and um, quite often they have been prescribed Ritalin um, and a lot of them had um, sort of really bad experiences of negative side effects. Um, Claire talking about when she got diagnosed states that I went to doctors because my mum thought this is not right for a kid to just run around and hit people and scream at teachers. They did a test and said she's got ADHD. <laughs> My mum was like, oh right, so they gave me medicine and then I took that but it was dead horrible. I tried not to take it but my mum used to force it down my throat. So when the, sort of, the young people were talking about their experiences in medication, there was kind of this idea that it benefits adults potentially more than it benefits the children themselves. Um, as I stated earlier, <coughs> all of the children have been removed from the mainstream education. There was only one that hadn't been sort of excluded from school. She'd made the decision to sort of remove herself because she wasn't happy in the school environment. So talking about their experiences in education, um, Whitney Barb states that I hated it, I hated it so much. I just hated it so much it was unbelievable how much someone could hate school. And then Adam is talking here about his experiences of um, what used to be referred to as a people referral unit <coughs> and he says horrible horrible really what did you, what you did because none of the kids paid attention in lessons you had to go back to the simple stuff like timetable and that addition it was just horrible <coughs> so he kind of felt like he would sort of had really negative experiences of the people referral units because he felt um, like it wasn't really meeting his needs in terms of um, what they were offering to education. <coughs> in terms of actually being removed from school and being excluded, um, Adam states that some schools just take it over the top, you have a little fight and get kicked out for nothing. 
say if you go to a school and you think it's good and you have a fight, some schools will kick you out and you've got that reputation, haven't you? Um, Adam had particularly bad experiences when he was trying to sort of get reintegrated back into mainstream education. The incident that happened um, in his school that he was excluded from was they got into a fight <coughs> and as a result of the fight he ended up hitting a teacher. Um, he said that he didn't mean to hit the teacher, the teacher kind of got in the way. Um, <coughs> but the next school that he went to, um, the head teacher of that school was friends of the teacher that had been hit in the accident. So during the interview, where there was um, sort of him and his mum had attended for him to be re sort of reintegrated back into mainstream school, the teacher, so kind of the head teacher, made it clear that she kind of knew what type of child he was, and he wasn't going to last long in that school. Um, the mum got really upset um, during this interview, but the kind of this idea that kind of once you've had this label attached to you, it kind of sticks with you throughout the rest of your educational journey, and then it will shape sort of how you're perceived um, by different adults. They also talked about kind of the real sort of struggle to get back into school. Um, so Zoe states that my auntie and my mum tried dead hard to get me back into schools, but they wouldn't ex accept me. It took quite a few weeks to get me into the school I'm meant to be in now. I was just sitting at home, not really doing nothing. <coughs> so kind of there were periods where they'd sort of be missing from education, um, where they weren't in sort of any kind of educational provision, which is really problematic. Um, <coughs> Jacob talking about his experiences in school um, states that he believes that you always get blamed for everything in normal schools because you've got disabilities. What was it really interesting for all the study was how the young people kept referring to mainstream school as being normal school. So they still was kind of clear distinction between special school and mainstream and mainstream kind of being held up as this ideal kind of normal environment to be in. And it's the children also, the young people, <laughs> sorry, acknowledge that kind of there'd be occasions where they'd really struggle in mainstream settings and due to kind of stuff around the class size, the size of the school. <coughs> so Bailey says, I would go, yeah, but I don't know if I would cope in a class of 30 kids and because I get frustrated with my work and you don't really learn anything, but I'd rather be staying in a school. So he's suggesting that he feels he's better off, in a way, in a special school than a mainstream school because he didn't feel like he could cope in a mainstream school environment. Um, a really kind of significant theme throughout this study was this idea of there being a culture of blame um, in education and the educational journeys of young people who've received with the ESD label. <coughs> so you'd have kind of teachers blaming parents, parents blaming teachers, teachers blaming young people, um, parents blaming young people. For the young people, they did acknowledge that sometimes kind of the way that teachers um, reacted to the behaviour might potentially then exacerbate sort of the situation. So Adam states that <coughs> he's talking about his particular experiences with one teacher. He would just like pick on me to do everything. He would sit there and if he was wound up, he would flip on me for no reason. He was horrible and I would tell him to shut up, swear at him. And this um, is also kind of reinforced by Louise, who states that I don't know, there are loads of teachers in our school that just get in your face. That does my head in, the teachers like get in my face. I just go to hit them and it just doesn't work for me. <coughs> so they were kind of real issues. And they'd be able to identify particular sort of teachers that they felt had kind of this particular idea about sort of the type of people that they were and would potentially exacerbate the behaviour in the classroom. Um, the, the young people also talked about kind of the parents. <coughs> um, I would acknowledge that sometimes something that happened at home would then have an impact in terms of how they behaved in the classroom. So Daniel says that sometimes I end up bringing it into school and I end up taking out on everyone and getting into more fights. Claire states, I don't get along with my mum and dad. I always argue with my mum and my dad always shouts. I would argue with my dad and I would just walk out and I would go and stay at my auntie's or my mates and I won't go to school the next day and it will make my mum stressed out. 
terms of thinking about sort of how the people perceive themselves, having this label attached to them clearly did shape sort of how they their own identity and <coughs> sort of how they did perceive themselves. So they make comments like I'm stupid, I'm dead thick, I've got too much stuff wrong with me, I can't even read, so I don't know why I am thick in words. And this was kind of reinforced by the special school head teacher who said that my understanding of BESD is a condition whereby a pupil has failed all elements of mainstream education and ended up coming down the special school's route because of elements of this condition they have which is linked to their behaviour. Obviously that's really probably, he's clearly stating that the problem is with the child um, and it's the pupil that's failed, it's the pupil's fault. Um, it was interesting that when this, um, when the head teacher was also talking about um, the parents um, and this idea of sort of there being a cycle of mutual blame between parents and teachers, when he was referring to the parents, he'd used terms like drug dealers and prostitutes um, to describe the parents of the children in the school. So he's clearly <coughs> got kind of pointing negative perception about those that are attending and it makes you question kind of why he's in sort of the role that he's in. <coughs> so in terms of being in the position of blame, um, the young people felt that, <coughs> um, so Claire says, I used to tell them that it's not my fault that I can't write, I used to say it is, you should be able to write at the age of five, I used to try my hardest. So there are certain expectations that we have with children and if you don't um, meet with those expectations then you're identified as having a problem. Um, as well as sort of the kind of the teachers kind of not being willing to sort of take responsibility um, for children's behaviour. Um, the mums, the parents kind of had a similar sort of feeling. Um, Helen's mum for example states I'm definitely not responsible for Helen not going to school. I get her up and I make sure she is ready to go. She just never ever went and she would just sit around on buses all day or go to town. <laughs> so this links in with this, um, this idea that children now have too many rights and are aware of their rights and this has had kind of a negative impact in terms of the way that children behave. Um, so one of the teachers at the special school says um, in terms of thinking about sort of ideas around people voicing children's rights, he says, I would say overall it's got worse. I think the pressure of society is that children rule rather than adults rule. A children's right to be in charge of their destiny is much higher, and nobody has told the children their rights are to be educated, to be looked after, not to do what they want to do. A child's rights include to be controlled, and somewhere along the line, and I think it happened in the mid 80s and 90s, all of a sudden children's rights came in and somebody never said hold it, it's not the right of the child to have their own way, it's the right of the child to be looked after. <coughs> so there are clearly sort of issues around ideas with regard to people voice and there's kind of been lots of research that suggested sort of teachers are quite often wary of ideas around people voice in that there's a fear it kind of might change sort of the power dynamics and that yeah this idea that children now have too much of a say in terms of what happens to them in education. So talking a little bit about when we got into the subject <laughs> of kind of the young people's experiences of um, things like school councils and having their voices heard in school. Adam states um, that they will pick, pick the little geek of the class or something some nerd, they wouldn't pick someone like one of them or me who have been kicked out. So there's clearly this idea that they wouldn't be seen as being worthy um, of having a voice. <coughs> so throughout the research I encountered a range of issues that have perhaps to some extent made me more cynical, but I still strongly believe we should be striving to hear voices and um, we just need to be open and honest with young people and reflect on our own position and the impact that that may have. <laughs> in many ways, the young people who participated in the study showed more insight and understanding than the adults. The study highlights the importance of providing opportunities for young people to have their voice heard and also adv advocates development participate to remedy methods. Adults are legally required to seek the perspectives of young people, yet it's adults, not pupils, who will determine how these voices are <coughs> heard. Evidently, this can work to manipulate or even silence the pupil voice. In addition, due to the position young people occupy within society, as suggested by Frank, 
is unlikely full, full participation will ever be achieved. <coughs> it isn't clear that in order for true participation to be achieved, there is a need to reconsider how we view young people. <coughs> so from the data gathered for the purposes of this study, it's clear that young people do have a lot to offer. Um, the study advocates any discussions around the people's education should include their voices. Previously, these young people have been dismissed by researchers and educators due to behaviours they display, and seemingly they have been considered unworthy of a voice. Clearly, the time has come for a change. It is considered essential that notions of pupil participation and voice are not confined to mere rhetoric. It would seem that adults remain cautious and wary of such concepts to the extent they are con concerned young people now have too much say in what happens to them. Yet when you talk to young people, the sentiment does not reflect their lived experiences. So the study aims to critically examine the educational journey ex experienced by pupils who have received the BESD label. <coughs> and this was to be achieved by hearing the perspective of pupil. And despite the time as accounted throughout the study, it's evident that young people do have important messages to share. Will we need the future for pupil voices unclear? This study advocates here in the people's perspectives. If we as adults continue to ignore their voices, we simply condemn them to an education system that is failing to meet their needs. And I'll just finish with a quote from Therese who says, When I got excluded, I felt left out. Like they haven't really helped me. They've just given up on me.